you stand with me as we read from, as I'm reading from Luke 17. Being asked to the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go out and follow them. Let's pray together. Our Father, <clears throat> we thank you for the word. Lord, we are, we're, not, uh, we're not bibliophiles, people who just love the Bible because of the Bible we love the Bible because of who it points us to. You're a God of words. You are a God of communication. And you have chosen you who are totally other than us. You are so far above us. We could never understand you. But you have, by this means, accommodated yourself on a permanent basis. Not a new message in the sky every day. Not some new manifestation. But Lord, a permanent record of who you are and what you're about to lead us, to guide us, and most of all, to bring us to you, to bring us to experience the grace that we've just been singing about, to teach us that against all natural inclination, we cannot earn our way to you, but we can have you for free. Help us to get that. And Lord, help that your grace would inform not just our salvation, but our everyday life and everyday experience. Help us now as we seek to understand you better from your word. Lord, speak to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be the one who ministers the word to us this morning. Apply it to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and please turn to Luke 17 as we continue this brief series on kingdom coming. Jesus will have a lot more to say about this when we get into a little bit in chapter 19 and, and more, much more in chapter 22, but kind of a preview here in this passage. Two psychiatrists were um, walking down the hallway in their hospital office one day, and a woman walked by as they were together, and as she went by them, she said, good morning. She kept on going, but they stopped and kind of looked at each other puzzled, and one of them said to the other one, I wonder what she meant by that, <laughs> which I think is the way psychiatrists often think, right? I wonder what the hidden message was. Well, I think that's the same question for different reasons that was constantly in the minds of the disciples while Jesus was here on earth. I wonder what he meant by that because he kept saying things that from their perspective just didn't make sense sense. By now, the time that we're in in Luke 17, they've invested nearly three years of their life in following Jesus, believing him by this time to be the promised Messiah from the Old Testament, the one who would lead Israel into, uh, deliver Israel from their captivity in Rome and lead them to freedom. Their expectations were running high as they're on this basically six-month journey from Galilee down to Jerusalem to celebrate there the feast of the Passover, and they believe to finally set up the kingdom. We're told in Luke 19, 11, they expected the kingdom to come immediately. This is what they were hoping for. This is why, by the way, you may be aware of the event, maybe not so much the reason, but this is why the disciples were constantly having this argument about who was the greatest. They were trying to position themselves for the highest positions in Jesus' kingdom. That's why James and John came to him in Mark 10, verse 37, and said to him, grant us to sit one on the right hand and one on the left in your glory. They had high hopes. You know, nothing Jesus had done, nothing he had said 
in some ways would have dismissed those. He taught as one who had authority, not like anyone that anyone else in that time had ever heard before. The greatest preacher that ever lived was the one that they walked with. The miracles that he did, of course, were absolutely unprecedented in the history of the world. And so they thought they had the right guy for sure. And yet, he kept saying these strange things, right? Like that he was going to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die and be raised again. And they just, you know, they just looked at each other like, boy, Jesus is deep. I, I, I don't know what he means, but he is really deep. I don't know what he means, but this is, you know, not what we exactly thought was going to happen. When the Pharisees came and asked Jesus, well, okay, when is the kingdom coming? You've been talking about it for three years. When is it coming? And Jesus answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. And the disciples heard all of this and their heads were spinning. And they're wondering, what I wonder what he meant by that. You know, with the gift of hindsight, we have some idea, right? We understand that the kingdom is multidimensional. That it has, yes, it has a physical, political component to it. But that Jesus did not come primarily to deliver from Rome or from Babylon or from Russia or whoever else we think the threat is at a given point in time. Jesus came primarily to deliver from sin. Now, the disciples were believers by this time. They had exercised faith in Christ. And so the spiritual element of the kingdom that was so important and that was the precursor to everything was, was in fact what they had already experienced. The spiritual element of the kingdom, that which is prior to the physical. But that had to be bought and paid for. God couldn't just issue a blanket waiver and say everybody is pardoned doesn't work that way. Sin always must be paid for. And so the expectations that the disciples have of the kingdom coming when they get to Jerusalem are, are going to be dashed, and Jesus knows that. This isn't going to be the time for the crown. This is going to be the time for the cross, that which is necessary to pave the way, to make the entrance requirement available to all people. That's what this time is about. But while there will be a delay in the physical part of the kingdom, it will come. So after Jesus has addressed the Pharisees concerning their question, answering in terms of the spiritual element of the kingdom, that they will not see this in ways that can be observed, he then turns to his disciples. Don't miss that he's talking to the Pharisees in one verse, but he's turned by now in verse 22, and began to talk to his disciples. And he addresses there their expectations of the kingdom, which includes the physical part of it. And his message is, it's not yet, but it's coming. It's not going to be when you think, but it's coming. And when it comes, it's going to be worth waiting for. The kingdom, when it comes, will be a wonder to those who are believers. It will be the worst nightmare for those who are not believers because you see, it has to be that way. If God's kingdom is gonna be one of perfection, then eventually not just the power of sin must be removed, which is the spiritual element of the kingdom, but the presence of sin must be removed. And those who are standing in their own, in their own merit will still have sin that has not been paid for. They will not have confessed Jesus as Lord. They will not have asked for forgiveness, and so they must be removed. All of this will happen at the second coming of Christ, a second coming that the disciples had not even thought about or anticipated in any way up to this point. Now, I want to take just a moment uh, to kind of orient us, and I'm not going to try to go to other, other than one or two passages of Scripture, to too much Scripture on this today, but the Bible has a big picture of where history is going. There are many prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled exactly and literally as they were prophesied in the Old Testament in the first coming of Christ, many of them. But there are other prophecies, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, which have not yet been fulfilled, which still need to come, still have to happen. 
One of the reasons we believe so much in the literal interpretation of the Bible and the fact that these things actually will happen is because what was prophesied about the first coming of Christ certainly happened literally, so we believe these will as well. So I wanna give you just a very quick overview this morning of what the Bible says is coming. The next thing on God's prophetic timetable, which could happen anytime, could happen today, it could be years from now, we don't know. Jesus said when he was here on earth, even he and his in his existence as the Son of Man did not know. But one day there will be something that we call the rapture. The rapture. That's the next thing on God's prophetic timetable, prophetic uh, uh, events. The rapture is kind of, I like to look at the second coming of Christ in two phases. The rapture is the first phase. What we call the second coming is the second phase. Don't get confused. We call them two things so that we know they're two different things. But the rapture is the next thing. What is the rapture? Well, the rapture is when those who are believers are taken out of the world. It's described for us in 1 Thessalonians 4. And you might like to turn there and we'll read a little bit about this rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians, a little bit of a hard book to find. It's not very big, but if you can get there. 1 Thessalonians 4, one of the great passages in the Bible. The Thessalonians were confused about some of these future things that Paul had taught them when he was there. And they were afraid that their loved ones who had died were going to miss the second coming of Christ. And so Paul writes this to help them understand what's going to happen. Here's what he says, 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 16. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So Paul's saying, listen, don't worry about your dead relatives. They're going to be ahead of you. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. That word caught up is where we get the name rapture. In Latin, which is the Bible that existed from the time that Jerome translated it for the next however many hundreds of years, the word caught up is the word rapturo in Latin. So we get the word rapture from that, caught up. Those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with Jesus in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we will always be with the Lord. That's the rapture. When could it happen? Any time. What has to happen before that could happen? Nothing. From the, from the standpoint of the prophecy of the Bible, this could happen in a moment, any time. Now, the rapture is followed by seven years of tribulation. We'll talk about those in just a moment. And then comes the second coming of Christ when he comes back to earth, all the way to earth. I believe those two things are separate for a lot of reasons. Let me just give you two. The rapture and the second coming, separated by seven years. The second coming is described in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, among many other passages. So if you want to look it up and read about it today, you can. But Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. And the description there you will find differs significantly from what we just read in 1 Thessalonians. Two ways that it differs significantly. In the rapture, Jesus comes in the clouds as we just read there in 1 Thessalonians 4. There's no indication that he comes any further than the clouds. In fact, those who are dead in Christ as well as those who are living in Christ at that time meet him in the air, in the clouds. And so Jesus comes in the clouds at the time of the rapture. Seven years later, after the tribulation period of time has happened on earth, Jesus will come all the way to earth and significant physical manifestations attached to that. For example, Zechariah chapter 14 tells us that he will arrive on the Mount of Olives, the very place where he ascended from in the first place, and that that mountain will split in two like a great earthquake has hit it. We don't know exactly why that will happen, but that's one of the things that will happen. So it's a very different description of Jesus coming. The second thing that's very different in these two things is that in the, in the rapture, the believers, dead and alive, are what? Resurrected to meet the Lord in the air. Meet him in the clouds. 
At the second coming, as described in Matthew 25, there's no meeting the Lord in the clouds. The Lord comes to earth. He sets foot on earth. All the, all the people, believers and unbelievers, meet him on the earth. Tells us that they are separated into two camps, the sheep and the goats, which means the believers and the unbelievers. But those are two very distinct and different things that seem to be described there. So I think the rapture is pre-trib, happens before the tribulation happens. And then Jesus comes again to set up completely after the tribulation period. So we have the rapture. Then we have this period of seven years of tribulation. A lot of places again in the Bible where we could go to find out about that. It basically builds on a prophecy that's in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, where Daniel prophesies a, a period of 490 years, different things that are going to happen to Israel. These are, these are, it's a period of, Daniel calls them 70 periods of seven years each. 70 periods of seven years each. All of them have happened before the first coming of Christ. That last period of seven years hasn't happened. Why? We'll see more about that next week because the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah. And so the time clock that God had for Israel stopped at that point in time, but it will be restarted. It wasn't thrown away. The prophecies didn't become null and void at that point in time. So we have this period of seven years. Now it's variously described in the Bible as the time of Jacob's trouble by Jeremiah. Jesus refers to it as beginning, at least the middle of it, as the time of the abomination that desolates in, uh, in, in his prophecies uh, on the Sermon on the Mount that we will see later. And he, he specifically refers to Daniel to let us know this is where he's coming from, what, what he's fleshing out here. The book of Revelation chapters 6 through 19 are describing this period of seven years in great detail. So if you want to know what the book of Revelation is about, that's what it's about from chapters 6 through 19. It's about this period of seven years of terrible tribulation. It's basically aimed at Israel. Everybody who's on earth gets involved in it, but it's basically to turn Israel to their Messiah finally. The Messiah that they have as a nation rejected, even though individual Jewish people come to faith in Christ. They will come as a nation finally, and according to Zechariah 12, they will see the one whom they have pierced, and they will finally turn in mass to Jesus as their Messiah. So we have this period of seven years. Now, at the end of that period, Jesus comes again. Things that are described in Matthew 24 and other places, Jesus will set foot on earth. There will be a judgment of those who are believers, those who are unbelievers. He will rule and reign for a period of 1,000 years on this earth, according to, this is all coming now from Revelation 20, 21, 22. He will rule for 1,000 years. At the end of that, Satan will be bound during that time, it specifically tells us. At the end of that time, he will be loosed. He will be able to foment through the nations, a rebellion against Jesus who's been ruling for a thousand years. A lot of reasons for that we won't go into this morning, but he will lead a rebellion. The rebellion will be put down almost immediately. There'll be the judgment of dead unbelievers who will now be resurrected to meet their final judgment. And then there will be the destruction of the old earth and the old heaven. There will be the creation of the new earth and the new heaven, and there will be eternity in the kingdom of God. That's the broad strokes of the picture that the Bible gives us. And again, we'll get into more detail on that as we get into chapters 19 and 22. But I wanted to give you this broad stroke idea so you can see where this is all going. This is what we can look forward to. Now Jesus comes back to the disciples then here in this passage. And by the way, that overview I just gave you, there are differences of opinion. Very godly Christian people have differences of opinion about the exact details of what I just said. But those broad strokes, I just challenge you to read Revelation 19 through 22, three or four chapters there, and come to a different conclusion. It's very clear. Just read them. It's clear what's going to happen and the order in which those things are going to happen. So in this passage, Jesus is going to give us to his disciples because he wants to raise their hopes. The, the, the hopes of what they want immediately are going to be dashed in Jerusalem. It's not going to happen right now. But it is coming. 
and he wants to raise their hopes, so he gives them here eight characteristics of his coming again to lift their hearts and to lift our hearts. We believe all these things in our minds, right? I, I think, I think if, you went, if I went around the room today and said, do you believe Jesus is going to come? Yeah, yeah, I believe Jesus is going to come. Really? Do you believe he could come any time? Do you believe that he could come today? Do you believe Jesus is physically going to set foot on planet earth and that he's going to rule and reign? Did you ever ask yourself, okay, is he coming? What's, what's he going to wear? Is he wearing a toga and sandals or is he going to be dressed like? I mean, what's he going to be like? Have you asked yourself this? How real is this to you? I don't know the answer to those questions. I just know I believe he's going to come. And we must believe he's going to come. This is our faith. This is our hope. I, I'll get skeptical, but you know, if you've watched TV for the last two weeks, there, this better be our hope, right? I don't see it anywhere else. This is our hope. Do you believe this? We need to realize this isn't fairy tales, and that's why Jesus is encouraging his disciples. It's not going to be your way in the way you want. It's not going to be in the timing that you want, but it is going to happen. And let me give you some characteristics of what it's going to be like. Eight of them. We'll take them over the next two or three weeks. Number one, Jesus' coming is desired by all true believers. Jesus' coming is desired by true believers. Look at verse 22. He said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. Now there's an interesting anomaly here. As you are reading your Bible, as you're studying your Bible, these are the kind of things you want to take notes on and then you know, it's probably a question in your, in your mind when you first look at it, but you want to go chase it down. Usually the Bible refers to end time judgment as what? As the day of the Lord. Singular right? It's mentioned all the way through the Old Testament, mentioned several times in the New Testament, day of the Lord. And yet Jesus refers here to one of the days, plural. And instead of saying one of the days of the Lord, he says one of the days of the Son of Man. One of the days of the Son of Man. He does the same thing in verse 26. If you just drop down there in Luke 17, he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. So he uses a plural there. What does he mean? What are the days? Why use days? Well, I think verse 26 gives us a clue. He says that as it was in the days of Noah, what does that mean? Well, that means the time in which Noah lived, right? Time in which he was occupied here on earth. Today's not one of the days of, the, of Noah. He's long gone. But for 900 and some, or 600 and some years, it was the days of Noah. I think it was 900 total, 600 before the flood. Those were the days of Noah. Those were the days when he was here. You could go around and you could find Noah. So what are the days of the Son of Man? Well, they are the days when the Son of Man will be here. It's the time of the Son of Man. It's the time when the Son of Man will be here on earth. And this is all coming. This phrase, Son of Man, comes from Daniel Seven. For the sake of time, we won't look at it, but there, there is a prophecy. It says in Daniel 7, verse 14, that at the end of time, here's a prophecy that God gave to Daniel way back there, 600 years B.C. He says, and to him, to him, this son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all peoples, nation, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So this son of, of man is a powerful person, right? And of course, this is a reference to Christ. This was Jesus' favorite designation of himself. Eighty times the phrase son of man is found in the Gospels. Most of the time is Jesus referring to himself as the son of man. What is he saying? Jesus is saying, that son of man that you saw back there in Daniel 7, it's me. I am the son of man. I'm the one. Everlasting kingdom and dominion, that's going to be me. Think of this powerful statements that Jesus made just like it was talking in a normal conversation. 
So the days of the Son of Man, where are they gonna be? Those are the days when Jesus will be reigning and ruling on earth. And what Jesus is telling his disciples here is, you're gonna long for those days. You're gonna wish they were here and they're not gonna be here right then. They didn't know it, but days of persecution were gonna come, right? They weren't gonna go to Jerusalem and set up the kingdom and the Son of Man would suddenly be on the throne. It wasn't gonna happen that way. And the days were going to come when they were going to long for the coming of the Son of Man. They would long for his coming to see the wickedness abolished and to see him reigning and ruling. The worst day in the kingdom is better than the best day in this world, right? They would long for that. But let me ask you, beloved, do you long for the days of the kingdom of God? We should. This is, this is one of the things that he gives us to look forward to in his word. Part of the glory of being, a, of being a, a Christian is to know that you're part of the kingdom of God and therefore to long for that. Why in the Lord's Prayer does he teach us to pray, your kingdom come? Because that's to be part of who we are. We want to see his kingdom come. We long for his kingdom to come. And if, you know what? If, if you don't care, you're kind of apathetic, life is pretty good anyway, are you really saved? Really? I think it's easy for us to get this way because we have lived in such a wonderful place at such a wonderful time. But beloved, this is not what our world really is, what we kind of experience on a daily basis. It's not what the world is, was, or ever permanently will be until Jesus comes again. Here's our world. I just, I just picked out a time a few months ago to, uh, or, or picked out a time to go back to the internet and say, what happened on this day? Here's what I found. On this day, an ISIS, and the, the Islamic, Islamic group called ISIS, which at the time was kind of being called Daesh by some people, they overran a Christian, they overran a Christian in, uh, a set, set or a settlement close to Baghdad. There was a British pastor there named Andrew White. He reported what happened. One of the things that happened was they grabbed a family that had four children, four children, all under the age of 15. They brought those children in and they said, listen, you just need to swear allegiance to Muhammad. Just say that you will be, that you will follow Muhammad. Just promise that you will follow Muhammad. The children wouldn't do it. They said, we're followers of Christ, all under the age of 15. So this went on for a little while until finally the soldiers said, listen, either pledge allegiance to, to, to Muhammad or we're, or, or, or we're going to kill you. And for the last time, those four children on the age of 15 said, no, we cannot do that. And they were decapitated right in front of their parents. This is the world we live in, beloved. I, I, I think, yeah, I don't know what's the worst, that or that, that our own country didn't, doesn't seem to care too much about what ISIS is doing. It's finally hitting enough home that we're getting around to it. But you know, they have they have killed families here and there. They've gone into Christian communities, said, listen, just pay a just pay us a tax and we will let you go. And they pay the tax and then they take them out and behead them anyway. You've seen it on, on television. But we don't just have that. We have murder in our streets on a regular basis anymore, right? Doesn't matter whether you're talking about Dallas, Texas, about Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge Louisiana, or, or Fulton, Missouri. Or what was the one I heard this morning? I've forgotten already where it was, but it, you know, another one. And uh, here we go. This is the world we live in. Wickedness is the norm. We don't get it because we live in this nice little bubble. We need Jesus. We need him to come again. And we should be praying for him to come again. People who are Christians love the kingdom. They long for the kingdom. They want to see the kingdom come because they realize the world we live in will never change until that happens. Uh, let me tell you what, and this, and, and this book will help document it for you in case you're in any doubt. You know, things are rapidly changing in our own little country here. Those who believe in Jesus Christ and are exercising their faith according to what the Bible teaches are paying a price already in America. People are losing their homes in some cases, losing their jobs in other cases. The courts are beginning to decide more and more and against the Christian faith. It is happening here. 
we will suffer. D.A. Carson says all that's required is if you live long enough, one will suffer. You just want to make sure your suffering is for the sake of Jesus Christ, right? But be prepared. C.S. Lewis, I love how he pictured this in his Narnia Chronicles. What is Narnia? Um, I think you could read those and not quite get where he's going. But what Narnia is is a representation of the earth that we live in, the world we live in, right? And he pictures it. He pictures it as a place where it's always winter and never Christmas. Until finally, the great lion, Aslan, the Christ figure in those books, arrives on the scene, right? And only then and only then does the snow begin to melt and the flowers begin to come up and color begins to fill the drab landscape that's been there before because Jesus has come. But believe it, what he's, what he's saying is what's true to the Bible, this will never happen. We will never have that experience until Jesus is here. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is going to set up his kingdom, but the timetable is his. So we need to be living for him. That's why he urges us to hold loosely the things of this world. That's why he urges us not to get too distracted, not to, to, to kind of limit our attachments. We have to live in the world. We're part of the world, of course. But don't get tied in. Don't get entangled. Don't think the answers are here. They are not. We need to be those who pray with John. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, hurry back. Jesus' disciples love and look forward to his coming. Second characteristic of the, of the kingdom. This was, this was a shocker to the disciples. Jesus' coming is not yet to the disciples. Jesus' coming is not yet to the disciples. Verse 22. The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. Now keep in mind that from Luke 19, 11, we know that the disciples are expecting the kingdom here and now. They've dedicated three years of their life to this. They're looking for the payoff. They've accepted Jesus as their Lord, as their Savior, and now they think we're going to get, we're going to finally see the, the end of this. We're going to see the fruit of this. We're going to get the payoff. And then Jesus goes on and describes a little bit about what the kingdom is going to be like when the culmination actually comes, but then he throws in these chilling words, which you're not going to see. Whoa. You're not going to get to see it. You will long for it. Rough days are ahead. There's going to be persecution. At the end, there will be the kingdom, but you will not see it. Now, what did Jesus mean? Did he mean that they would never see the kingdom? Of course not. You're back again to Revelation 20, 21. You'll find out that the names of the 12 apostles are written into the foundation stones of the kingdom. They're going to be there. But what is Jesus saying? Not in this lifetime. Not in your lifetime. You're not going to see the kingdom. Now, he's not saying that necessarily to our lifetime because now the, king, the, the coming of Jesus is imminent. But for the disciples, not in your lifetime. That's what he was saying. Guys, I know you're expecting the culmination and the coronation in a couple of weeks when we get to Jerusalem. And I just have to tell you, not going to happen. It's not going to happen the way you think. It's not the timetable. This is the time for the cross that has to precede the crown. This is the time when the forgiveness has to be paid for. This is the time when the deliverance from sin will be provided so that ultimate, ultimate political deliverance can be provided. But this is the time when the kingdom will be bought and paid for. You're going to see that. But you're not going to see the outward expression of the kingdom, the culmination of the kingdom that you're looking for. It's going to be delayed beyond your lifetime. Now, I'd already given a hint of that in Luke 9, 27. If you just turn back a couple pages. Jesus had said to the disciples at that point in time, Luke 9, 27, 
It says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. You say, well, it doesn't say they're not going to see it. It says they are going to see it. Well, read it again. What it says is there are a couple of you. There are some standing here who will not taste death. We know who those are. Who were they? Peter, James, and John. And in what sense did they see the kingdom? The verses that follow immediately, beginning in verse 28 of Luke 9, you, see, you have Jesus taking these three up to the Mount of Transfiguration where all of a sudden in the middle of the night they saw Jesus light up like a light bulb. His being, his clothing, his everything. They were seeing a preview of the kingdom. They were seeing the glory of God being evident in the person of Christ. They were seeing the deity of Christ break through the human veil that had been there through his whole life up till that point. And they were getting a preview of the kingdom of God. Here comes Moses. Here comes Elijah. Here comes God the Father in a cloud and speaking to them. What are they seeing? They are seeing the kingdom in preview. Those are the three who didn't taste death until they saw the kingdom. But the very fact that Jesus says, there are some who will not taste death until they see the kingdom means that there are some who will taste death before they see the kingdom, right? And in fact, what Peter, James, and John saw was the kingdom in preview form. They saw it in a very, you know, couple of hours or however many hours they were up on that mountain that night, and that was it for them too. They also are part of the group now in Luke 17 that Jesus says you're not going to see it in your lifetime. What they saw as a preview isn't going to happen until later. And so they all die before the kingdom in its full and complete form comes. You will not see it. So the disciples who were working toward this end did not get the chance to see it. Now turn with me to Acts 1. Turn with me to Acts 1. Because as Jesus is saying, you're not going to get to see it, they must have been saying to themselves, I wonder what he means by that. And you would think that they would get it, but when we come to Acts 1, we find out that even after he has been died and he has been resurrected, it's, it's still not coming through to them, even though he's told them. The disciples, you know, I, you'd like to say they're dense. I know I wouldn't have done any better in their, in their shoes. But Jesus kept saying multiple times, Matthew tells us, time after time in those last six months, he told them, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, I'm going to be raised again. I, I'm, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die, I'm going to be raised again. And the disciples were saying to themselves, I wonder what he meant. And, and, and Mark tells us he told them plainly, plain English, only it wasn't English, it was Aramaic, but whatever, you get the point. As plain as you can tell, he told them. And they weren't getting it. And now we come, he's, he's, been, he's died, he's been resurrected, everything's going along fine. And here he is six weeks later and he's still around, he's still teaching them. And so they do the natural thing as they come out to the Mount of Olives one day. Acts chapter one and verse six. And they ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Still hasn't dawned on them. What's going on? And Jesus patiently, patiently loved the patience of God. We all need the patience of God desperately. He's so patient with them because he knows their hearts are right. He tells them it's not the time to speculate. He tells them, listen, this is for God to know. This is not for you to know. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Stop worrying about when this is going to happen. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to go be my witnesses. I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to go to Judea. I want you to go to Samaria. I want you to go to the ends of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses. Okay. But still, how's this going to happen? And they know that he's talked about, you know, he's given parables where he talks about, you know, somebody going away and then he comes back again and they're still not getting it. But I'll tell you what, in just a moment, Things begin to, the puzzle pieces began to fall into place. Why? Because in just a moment, he wasn't there. He disappeared. Look at it. Acts 1, verse 9. 
When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come, will come, will come. Right? He will come. He's coming again. He will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I think this is about the point at which time they began to say, so that's what he meant. So that's what he meant. Because now they're beginning to see there must be a second phase to all of this. Who was the landowner that's going away, that's going to come back later? It's Jesus. What they hadn't been able to see is suddenly becoming plain to them. You know, one of the reasons I believe that is if you were Jesus' follower and you invested all this time and effort and, and all of your emotional you know, baggage into Jesus and, and then suddenly he's going away, wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think you would suddenly, you'd be crying out, come back? But that's not what happened. Luke tells us they went back to Jerusalem rejoicing. They were happy. It was all coming together. They were beginning to see, okay, I get it. I get it now. Jesus came once, but he's going to come again. Jesus told us he wasn't really going away. He'd be with us in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And about, you know, just a couple days later, bam, the Holy Spirit, who had, who, who had not been in them in the same way that he was going, going to, invaded them and has invaded every believer ever since. According to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, they began to get it. There's a second phase to all of this. So while Jesus' coming was not yet to the disciples, we don't know when it's going to be. So not yet for us, we don't know. Don't you want Jesus to come today? Thirdly, back in Luke 17, So Jesus' coming is longed for by every true believer. Secondly, Jesus' coming was not yet to the disciples. Thirdly, Jesus' coming will be unmistakable. Jesus' coming will be unmistakable. Verses 23 and 24. Now remember, he's just described the spiritual side of the kingdom of God and said you're not going to be able to see that. You're going to see the kingdom's going to come and you're not going to be able to observe it. Why? Because the coming of the Spirit of God into the heart of a person, you can't see it. I can't see it. I, can't, I couldn't see the Holy Spirit when he invaded my life. You couldn't see it when he invaded yours, but he came if you've invited him in. It's as real as you sitting here this morning. But you can't observe that. But there's this physical phase that is coming. So Jesus says in verse 23, he says, and they will say to you, look here, look there. Don't go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and the lights from the sky, lights, and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will be the Son of Man in his day. When Jesus comes again, and Matthew makes an even bigger point of this, and he will in Luke 22. When Jesus comes again, nobody's gonna miss it. One of the greatest, delu- listen, one of the greatest delusions of our time, good people propagate this, is the idea that we are bringing in the kingdom of God. We are not bringing in the kingdom of God, beloved. That's not our task. Jesus is going to tell these disciples, little flock, I give you the kingdom. The kingdom is something you get as a gift. We are to live as citizens of the kingdom. We're to be kingdom representatives in in an earth that's chaotic. All of that's true, but we will not bring in the kingdom. Don't, you know, don't go there. You'll frustrate yourself. Should we as individuals be worried about social injustice and all of these kind of things? Absolutely. But our mandate is not Go, bring about social justice. Our mandate is go, make disciples, right? That's our mandate. Jesus will take care of bringing in the kingdom. And when it comes, it will be unmistakable. The whole world will know instantly. Do you know that? The whole world will know instantly when Jesus comes again. The whole world! Look at verse 34 and 35, we'll get there, but 
not today, but just get a preview. Look at it. 34 and 35, he says, I tell you that in that night there will be two in bed, one will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding one together, one will be taken, the other left. What's he picturing? He's picturing here's gonna be a couple of people in bed on the other side of the world, a couple of people working. They'll all see it. They'll all know. The kingdom of God, when it comes, will be unmistakable. All the secrets will be out. And it will happen in a moment of time. Jesus warns against those who say it ahead of time. You know, like, well, Jesus is over there in Israel somewhere. He's come and he's just he's doing this or that in some kibbutz over there, right? I've heard that. Jesus, you know, we got groups running around with Bibles going door to door. Well, Jesus has already come. He's, part, he's, he's in our group. No, he is not. You will not be able to mistake him when he comes. There will be no doubt that Jesus has arrived back on the scene. You might have missed his first coming. You won't miss his second coming. Everyone will know from the far ends of the earth. Listen, here, look at... Look. Turn to Revelation 19. Look at this description. See if you think anybody's going to miss this. Revelation 19 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. So much, so much here. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. Now keep in mind, (laughs) to really appreciate this passage, you have to read all the way through Revelation up till this point. You have to go through all the blood and gore and demons and (laughs) wickedness and evil that's going to inhabit the earth and the sun and moon, you know, a third of them disappear. You got to read through all of that and then you get to this verse, 1911. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and his head, on his head are many diadems, meaning he's the king of kings, the ruler of all rulers. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. The basis of all of this is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. That's believers who have died previously. You, you die ahead of time, you be part of this army, if you're a believer. From his mouth, verse 15, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread out the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh is written a name, King of Kings. Lord of Lords. It's what the disciples wanted. This is what we should want. It's what we should desire. It's what we should long for. It's what we should pray for. It is coming. It's just not yet. When's it going to be? I don't know. I hope it's today. But I know it's coming. He's coming again in power and might and glory. He's not going to come as a baby this time. He's not going to be coming to seek and to save that which was lost this next time. He's going to be coming to judge those who have not accepted him and he's coming to reward those who have. King of kings and Lord of lords. So what must we do? Well, first of all, we must be ready, right? Are you ready? Are you ready for the kingdom of God? Does the king, does the king rule in your heart so that one day he can rule in your world? So he, can't, he won't rule your world if he doesn't rule your heart. God invite him in. He has to be the Lord of all of your life. Because before he will be Lord of all of your world. And so I hope you've invited him in. If not, why wouldn't you invite him in today? That phase of the kingdom is available now. And then what? If we're, if we're believers, now what? Well, Luke 19, 13 tells us what we want to do. It says, engage in business until I come. What's the business? The gospel. Letting others know, Jesus died for you. You can have forgiveness of sins. You can be part of the kingdom. All you got to do is say yes. A yes, which means your life is devoted to him. Engage in business till I come. Don't get entangled in this world. Use your gifts and abilities to represent the king. One eye fixed on the mission, one eye fixed on eternity. A little six-year-old girl, Tiffany, she just finished watching Disney's Cinderella for the umpteenth time, I assume. 
Um, she said to her mom, she said, Mom, wasn't this great? She said, I, I, I hope I meet my prince someday. And her mom said, oh, Tiffany, she said, you'll meet your prince someday. Don't you worry. She said, I met my prince the day I met daddy. Tiffany says, you did? She said, who was he? <laughs> who was this prince? Jesus is the prince. Jesus is the king. You can meet him now. You don't have to wait. But you won't recognize him then if you don't acknowledge him now. You know what John said? I love what John, this is another favorite. First John 3 said, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Listen, this gospel doesn't make you take things for granted. This gospel makes you live a pure life. What a hope we have in Jesus, right? It's what he's telling the disciples. It's not gonna happen the way you think. It's not gonna happen on the timetable you want, but it is gonna happen. Be ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these promises. As we bow before you this morning, we worship you. It's been a week, Lord, that's been hard for some. A lot of loss this week. None of it escaped your control. None of it escaped your notice. And so we worship you. We extol you. We do what you told us when you said, when you said rejoice when hard things come. When you meet various trials, rejoice. I'm in charge. I'm in control. Trust me. And so we're here this morning, Father, to say we trust you. We're so privileged because when you give us these words of hope about a second coming, we've been privileged to know what the first coming was like. We see it was literal in every sense. We see that when the Bible said you'd be born in Bethlehem 800 years before it happened, you were born in Bethlehem, although your family lived in Nazareth. We see that when the Bible said you would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, you were betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. We see that when the Bible said you would be pierced, you were pierced. We see that all of these prophecies were fulfilled literally, so why would the second coming not be the same? We look forward to it. We pray for it. Lord, today wouldn't be too soon. Help us to be looking. In the meantime, help us to engage in business till you come, to be faithful, to love you above all. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.